The previous U.S. president famously remarked, trade wars are good and easy to win. That marked a real departure after decades of globalization. A quite different take emerges in the pages of this year's winner of the Lionel Gelber Prize for Foreign Affairs. The book is called Trade Wars Are Class Wars, How Rising Inequality Distorts the Global Economy and Threatens International Peace. It's co-written by Matthew C. Klein and Michael Pettis, and it brings Matthew Klein to our virtual studio tonight from San Francisco, California. Matthew, it's great to meet you. Congratulations on the Gelber Prize. I guess this has not been the worst last few weeks of your life. No, no, no. Thank you very much for having me. Not at all. Let's start with an excerpt of the book, shall we? Trade war, you write, is often presented as a conflict between countries. It is not. It is a conflict mainly between bankers and owners of financial assets on one side and ordinary households on the other, between the very rich and everyone else. Rising inequality has produced gluts of manufactured goods, job loss, and rising indebtedness. It is an economic and financial perversion of what global integration was supposed to achieve. Okay, let's dig into that, Matthew. Are you saying all these years we've essentially been tricked into believing that our countries are fundamentally at odds due to our different nationalities? I think that's largely it. That's right. That you know, the, the Trumpian language that you quoted at the beginning reflects this very outdated idea that countries are these unified entities that compete with each other economically and that one country prospers at the expense of another. And our point is that that's not true at all, that actually the global economy is a unified system, that we're all living together and we all either prosper or, or not, and that, that conflicts really exist within societies as much as across, much more than across borders. And, you know, to look at this sort of concretely, when we think about, you know, the China-U.S. conflict, for example, that Trump was talking about, it wasn't that Chinese workers did well at the expense of American workers and, you know, Chinese workers took our jobs, that sort of thing. What really happened was that there were changes within China that we describe in the book that were ultimately bad for a lot of people within China. And that is a side effect of this. were also bad for a lot of people in the United States and elsewhere. So is that to say the billionaire in China and the billionaire in America they actually have more in common with each other than say Americans do with Americans or Chinese with Chinese. Economically, I think that's right. Obviously there are other sort of political factors that are sort of outside the scope of the book in terms of you know ideology or national security or things of that nature. But when we're talking about sort of the strict economics of this, that's absolutely right. That it's not as if that America as a country does well economically at the expense of China economically. It's really that there are certain entities within these societies that can cooperate with each other or, uh, you know, at the expense of others within their own society. And that's, what, that's what's been happening for, you know, 30, 40 years. Is that to say, Matthew, that nationalism or some sense of national consciousness is not for you and your co-author um, a significant form of identity to you? Well, it's clearly a significant form of identity in terms of how people choose to, you know, think of themselves and, and affiliate politically. I, I would, I would not, you know, discount that. I, I think the question is, is it useful as a, as a, as the unit of economic analysis for understanding what's going on in the world? So, clearly, that you know, these things matter. I mean, I, I consider myself an American. I'm not, you know, ashamed of that in any way. But I think if the question is, you know, what is driving changes in the U.S. economy or the global economy or changes in the relationship between different societies? It's very important to understand what all the moving parts are and that in many cases it's very useful to actually look within each society and instead of thinking of international economics as just being about you know this country does this this country does this it's much more helpful to you know look at all the moving parts and see that there's actually a connected global system and that there are certain groups across countries that have more in common with each other and, and cooperate or, or conflict with each other in ways that are distinct from the national boundaries People who are watching this or listening to this right now are going to want to be able to kind of peg you somewhere on the political ideology on the political ideology continuum. And as I look at some of the language in the book, you know, workers have no homelands. They are bound by proletarian solidarity. They should unite. They should bring down the bankers and business owners. This does sound a little Karl Marx. Would you grant that? I mean, I can see why someone would say that, but at the same time, I think the recommendations are quite different. You know, if, if there's really any, you know, the, the explicit lineage that we that we talk about in the book are people like John Hobson and John Maynard Keynes, who were essentially in the sort of liberal reformist uh, English uh, tradition. And the idea being that, you know, we don't view any sort of fundamental problem with, you know, capitalism itself, whatever exactly, you know, however you want to define that. Uh, it's more that there happen to be sometimes certain glitches that need to be addressed and that undermine the effective functioning of the system. But that's very different, I think, than sort of the, you know, sort of Marxist-Leninist view of inevitable crises and, and things of that nature. So I, I would not 
characterize this as, as you know, particularly cer certainly not Leninist. I mean, you can you know you can argue how much Marx was you know misinterpreted later, but I, I wouldn't really I would I would sort of put it more in as I said, sort of the uh, the Keynesian you know Hobsonian tradition. Okay, let's uh, put China under the microscope for a moment here because uh, the Chinese will be the first to tell you that they have lifted hundreds of millions of people because of their brand of authoritarian capitalism out of poverty um, and into some form of prosperity. But um, according to the way you look at things, they still need massive wealth redistribution uh, to boost household income. What do you think is still not quite going right in China? There's a lot of you know, separate parts here. I mean, one thing I think that's that's instructive just as a useful point of comparison is that right now, even though, uh, you know, China's growth over the past several decades has been incredibly impressive in, you know, in percentage terms. And even though you have some really advanced uh, technology being made there and advanced, you know, large successful companies that are based there, it's worth pointing out that the average, uh, you know, income per person in China is the same as in Mexico. And that, that reflects, you know, an average that comes, you know, you have very wealthy coastal cities on the one hand, and then you have very, very large, relatively underdeveloped, uh, poor rural areas. So it's not as if uh, China has, has managed to develop the kind of wealth that we would associate with, say, you know, Europe or Japan, or the United States, Canada. And the question is, you know, to what extent has the have the choices that the, the Communist Party and the government made in terms of its development strategy led to, you know, the best possible outcome. And, and the point that we make is that you can have periods of very rapid growth, especially if you're starting from a very low base, which China was uh, in the late 1970s, after, you know, more than 100 years of war and revolution and, and Maoism and so forth. If you're starting from a very low base, you can go very quickly. The question is, you know, at what point does that kind of development model break down. And, and the development model they used was one that we've seen in, in other societies in the past, including um, in the Soviet Union, where essentially you just squeeze workers as much as possible in ordinary households to divert resources to businesses and local governments to make investments in infrastructure. And when you haven't had any investments in infrastructure really in over 100 years, that can work very well. The problem is that you end up in a situation pretty quickly where you create a First of all, you end up over investing in, in infrastructure that people don't necessarily need or can afford at the expense of other things. There's a, a book that came out just very recently, actually after our book came out, that, that talks about this in detail about the kinds of conditions in rural China of, you know, there, the, you have high speed trains being built in places where children aren't you know, able to have glasses, for example. And, and like that clearly seems to be sort of a misallocation of resources. Clearly, over the longer term, it's better to have, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people be able to read and so forth and be able to go somewhere on a shiny train they, they can't use. So there's that element of it. And then, and then there's also the fact that it creates this, this sort of distorted set of incentives where the people who benefit tremendously from this distorted political economy, the, the owners or the managers of the state owned enterprises or the, the provincial government officials really end up becoming a very powerful enemies uh, of reform. And in fact, the Chinese leadership has talked about this in the past. They called them the, uh, Li Keqiang has called them the vested interests. And what that means is that these entities then block any efforts to reverse some of the really harmful changes that limit the spending power of ordinary Chinese people. And so even though it's been a repeated theme of, uh, you know, Communist Party plenary sessions for at least 15 years at this point, that more should be done to lift average household incomes, uh, the median household income to allow more consumption of, of goods and services by people who live in China to raise living standards. Even though that's been acknowledged repeatedly, uh, you haven't seen any progress in that whatsoever. And in fact, the result is that the share of economic output produced by Chinese households and businesses that's actually consumed by people in China is extraordinarily low and remains extraordinarily low. In fact, it's fallen over the course of the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And so it, 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 that's really, I think, the kind of the big fundamental economic problem and challenge that, that China faces. And one of the points we make in the book, which we explain in detail, is how this also has a lot of significant effects on people in the rest of the world, even if that's not necessarily how people in China are thinking of these problems. Well, you mentioned bullet trains, and let me pick up on that example, because, of course, the Chinese are very proud of their gleaming new skyscrapers and their thousands upon thousands of kilometers of new roads and so on. But as you point out in the book, what's the rest of the story there? Right. And so 
uh, you know, a lot of your question is how there there were choices and trade offs that were made here, and and you look at the some of the key features of, you know, what were China's development models, the transfers that we talk about that that were forced on ordinary workers and households, and and among them are things such as uh, essentially expropriation of of peasant land, and we would you see this less now because it's sort of happened, you know, sort of played itself out, but there were you know basically real estate developers and so forth were able to seize. Uh, land that peasants had been owning or for, not owning explicitly, but, you know, farming and, and living on for a very long time at, at very cheap prices. There were there were protests about this all over China or have been, you know, for, for decades uh, and violently. Um, the adversarial labor unions are illegal and people, in fact, even you have situations, there's a, there's a couple of years ago, you had situations where, you know, students at sort of elite Chinese universities who've been reading the Marxist texts that were part of their curriculum decided that they should, you know, follow on uh the lessons that they've been learning and go into factories and organize people and they were promptly arrested and then you know forced to sort of confess that they've done something in error so this is a you know th that's a, a major uh element of of the the social model there's the household registration system probably the single biggest one the, the huko system which is uh created uh or sort of its modern form is created under mao and the idea being that you limit internal mobility within china so people can't go from the countryside to the cities easily and that that got loosened over time so obviously you have had hundreds of millions of people move from the countryside to the cities but in in doing so, they forfeit a lot of the sort of normal economic and and sort of social rights that people who have city hukos have. So they have to pay local taxes, for example, but they don't have access to healthcare, education, or retirement benefits, or unemployment insurance, or all the things that people who have the huko locals have. And so, for example, in the in during the pandemic, you had you know there aren't any sort of exact statistics available, but the estimates that we saw from people who were in China looking at this were that you know. 50 to 60 million people ended up leaving the cities to go back to the farms to live as subsistence farmers because you know there was no unemployment insurance and, and so forth and so these are the kinds of things and you know lack of environmental protections for example these are the kinds of things that collectively add up to large subsidies for uh, businesses both chinese owned businesses and foreign owned businesses at the expense of people who live in china and you can argue there might be particular circumstances or points in time when those subsidies are valuable because they encourage investment that's needed in the country but it probably hasn't been true for you know 15 20 years and that as a result is now just actually harming the longer term growth of, of chinese society at the expense of people who live in china well, let's do some comparing and contrasting here. That's China. Let's compare and contrast to the United States, which in the book you describe as having an exorbitant burden becoming the world's dumping ground. What do you mean by that? So this is sort of an interesting and surprising fact, I think, for a lot of people, which is that the U.S. dollar, people talk about it as the global reserve currency, and people say it's this great privilege. The exorbitant privilege is a phrase that the French you know, came up with in the 1960s. And you hear it, you know, more recently since then. And our point is that that's not really the right way of thinking about it. That that actually the better way of thinking about this is that as the U.S. economy shrinks in relative size compared to the rest of the world, so the U.S. economy is now about a quarter of global GDP, which is the single largest economy, but you know, obviously nowhere close to the majority. If the U.S. financial system and the U.S. dollar are uh, used by people all over the world. And the U.S. financial system, as a consequence, responds to and adapts to the needs of people outside the United States. That has a lot of consequences for people in the United States, potentially quite negative. And, you know, that's essentially the point that, that we talk about in, in the book, which is that, you know, if, if people outside the U.S. for their own reasons want to hold dollar assets, and there are a lot of specific reasons why they might want to do this, then that ends up creating a need for American banks and others to create dollar assets. And in, in, in plain English, that means that Americans have to borrow more than they otherwise would because some people want to lend to Americans regardless of whether Americans actually want to borrow anything. And that ends up leading to a whole lot of distortions, including an overvalued currency, which in turn ends up meaning that American manufacturers have a much more difficult time selling goods both abroad because their goods are going to be priced relatively expensive compared expensively uh, compared to goods made in other countries. And it also means that American manufacturers are going to have a harder time selling goods in the United States because, again, their goods are going to be relatively more expensive compared to imports. And that's, in fact, what we've seen. And there's some really good studies that have been done by 
people at the, the New York Fed uh, and others. And what they found is that in the 2000s, which is a period of really intense deindustrialization in the United States in terms of both job losses and, and overall output, uh, what you saw was that on the one hand, you had a lot of job losses and destruction of manufacturing in the United States. And at the same time, you also had a really big increase in those same places in household debt. And so when you can think of this essentially as people lose their jobs or their hours get cut or things of that nature, but at the same time, they're able to offset a lot of the impact, not all, but a lot of the impact on their living standards by being able to borrow much more cheaply against their home than they otherwise could have in the past. And of course, that turned out not to be a very sustainable process as we saw in sort of 2008. But it, you know, for a while, it seemed to work. And that that's sort of the, the exorbitant burden. And that's an example of the kind of thing that occurs. And there are different ways of of transmuting that burden. It didn't have to be households that, that took on the burden the way they did, but it's sort of an essential feature of the international economic system as it currently exists that if people in the rest of the world want to spend less than they earn, and then they want to save and they want to invest those savings in uh, the United States, then there has to be a corresponding effect on Americans, whether or not Americans have any particular desire to you know, borrow more or, or produce less. In which case, Matthew, you've outlined what you see as a, a broken international trading system. What would you like to see happen instead? So the basic thing is that a lot of the stuff we think of as being trade related are in many ways sort of residual effects of this deeper problem we talk about, of the, 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 the increase in inequality and, and what that does to the global economy. So if we step back for a second and imagine, you know, just for the sake of the argument here, we, do, we don't look at national borders. We just look at the, the global economy as a whole. What we've seen for the past several decades is a situation where businesses are capable of producing a lot more than consumers seem to be willing or able to absorb. And there's an imbalance there basically between ample global supply and relatively weak demand. And our argument is that that is itself a function of the fact that we've had these transfers of income and purchasing power towards the very, very rich. And this isn't a moral judgment about whether rich people are good or bad. It's just sort of a basic observation that people who earn extraordinarily large amounts of money, and, and as a consequence, also, if you have a shift in you know income in terms of profit margins to, to businesses, because the same effect, they don't spend those things on goods and services. And if you're not spending on goods and services, you're not directly creating jobs and incomes for other people. You're, what you're doing is you're creating uh, markets for financial assets. So you're making it easier for people to borrow, but you're not creating people income. And so that creates uh, a tension there, which is essentially what we've seen, which is that there's less, it's harder to get a certain amount of demand for goods and services than in the past. Uh, and except there has been demand, enough demand for goods and services to keep people employed globally, it's required very, very large increases in debt, whether it's government debt or household debt. And that's a fundamentally unstable system. And our point is that that's the global picture as a whole. You can then look and see that these things don't add up across countries in an even way. So you might have a very large increase in inequality in, say, China or in Germany. And the increase in indebtedness doesn't necessarily take place there. It could take place somewhere else. And in fact, that's what we've seen. And that shows up in, in these trade imbalances and that people perceive this as being a trade conflict. And then you have the challenge that we talk about in the book where a lot of people think of this as some sort of deliberate strategy of you know, the Germans taking advantage of the Greeks, when in re reality, it's a much more you know, complex and, and nuanced picture. And that's really the basic problem here. And so the way to fix this in some ways, it's very simple. It's you just address this, these inequalities of distribution. You just tweak, you know, tweak the distribution of income a little bit. You don't have to do anything particularly radical. You don't have to, you know, undo capitalism or come up with some big innovation. We know how to do income redistribution in a pretty reasonable way in terms of, you know, a little more welfare spending, a little more tax, progressive taxation. That's not complicated, and that should allow for uh, an organic growth in consumption by people out of income rather than out of debt that will and, and allow for a rebalancing uh, towards more spending. And then the global trading system would work a lot better. Once you have a situation where uh, companies aren't sort of forced to keep fighting over the sort of stagnant market share, but instead everyone is able to, you know, sell more because demand is growing and, and, and markets are growing. And, and you, have, you immediately end up in both a more prosperous global society and a much less adversarial society. And that's really, I think, what we would want to achieve. Well, in our last couple of minutes here, let me hone in on that last point, because that's the consequence, right? You suggest of not doing it your way, of not uh, reimagining the world trading system, is that you think we could be on the verge of, well, it's a threat to world peace in your view. Is that right? Yes. I mean, I think 
I don't want to say that if that we're going to have World War III as a consequence of this, but I do think it's fair to say, just looking at what's already happened, that economic conflicts and deprivation and the not entirely wrong belief that people outside of your own country are responsible for your problems, it does lead to a less stable international system. This is something that was recognized in the past as well. I mean, you look at what Keynes was writing in, in the 1930s, and he made this point explicitly. He said, you know, if we're able to figure out how to get full employment at home without having to, you know, shift problems abroad, you know, essentially using the exact same framework, we borrowed this essential framework, then, you know, you don't have to worry about the kinds of conflicts that he, he was seeing. And this was writing in 1936. And, you know, in the context of the Great Depression and, and the trade conflicts that were occurring at that time. And again, I mean, you can look at the world as it's been over the past 10 years, whether it's the rise of a lot of antagonism between, you know, whether it's within Europe or even between Europe and the United States sometimes, or certainly between the U.S. and China. And obviously there are a variety of factors in all these things taking place. But I think a key element that we can't ignore is the economic backdrop in all these cases. And if we're able to fix this in a constructive way, then presumably that will alleviate a lot of tension. And if we don't, then that creates a really unfortunate situation. It certainly increases the the risk of conflict and 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 lowers the the chance of sort of amicable resolution of you know non economic conflicts. How do you like Biden versus Trump as being the guy who gets to try to lower the temperature right now? I think so far the Biden administration has been doing a lot of the things that we would have suggested. Uh, I think the challenge is that. You know, the U.S. is the single largest element of the global system, but it's still a minority. And a lot of the point that we make in the book is that you know, there's only so much agency that, say, the United States has to on itself for the global economy, that a lot of the big changes we would want to see or arguably need to see are in other societies, whether it's Europe or China or, or other countries we don't talk about as much. And so the question is, you know, what kinds of changes can we expect to see there uh, there are some encouraging signs actually coming out of Europe and, and Germany in particular, and, and it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out in the next couple of years. But I, I think while you know the Biden administration is moving more in the direction of looking at the world the way we would, I think that that in and of itself, unfortunately, would not be sufficient for really addressing uh, the problems that we describe. Well, as we often say on this program, stay tuned. Matthew C. Klein, co-author, Trade Wars Are Class Wars. We congratulate you once again on winning the Lionel Gelber Prize for Foreign Policy. And uh, we wish you well in these uh, difficult days ahead. Take care. Thank you very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.